Hello and welcome to Last Call. Jake Kiefer alongside Nathaniel Finch and Graham Shear, our soccer and tennis correspondent. We have a lot of UND news to cover, UND sports, and we're going to pivot gears. We're going to talk about some D1 football. We're going to talk about some pro football, maybe get into some Monday night previews. So let's get started. Graham, UND men's soccer was on a win streak, and then something happened to derail that. What? But that's not the end of the world, right? Tell us more. So they have a big game this Sunday coming up. It's going to be their biggest game of the year. So Michael Talasios and Ebo Yilmaz, two big go goal scorers for UND. They each scored a goal on Sunday, uh, but they ended up losing to Missouri S&T 3-2, the final score there. And they also beat Rockhurst earlier this year. 1-0 one, one was the final score. So they were on a seven-game win streak earlier this season. They ended up losing that winning streak. On Sunday, they lost to Missouri S&T, so now they've won seven of eight. They finished the overall regular season, nine, three, and three, the final score, their final record, I should say, in 15 games. They're third in the GLVC, and it's gonna be really interesting because they've already beat Rockhurst, they beat the Hawks this year, they beat them 1-0. It's gonna be really interesting to see if their defense can kind of step up and come up big against the Hawks on Sunday. So you mentioned it's their biggest game of the year. They're hosting the GLVC tournament quarterfinals, the first round. So the, like you said, they're third in the GLVC. If the top two teams, Maryville and Lewis, I believe, if they both mm -hmm. lose, then suddenly they get to host a quarterfinal or a semifinal game. But their biggest game is on Sunday. We're going to have that on UND TV as well. We're going to broadcast that here on this very YouTube channel. So be sure to catch that at 2.30 on Sunday is the time that that game is gonna be started as uh, the broadcast will start around 2.25. So make sure to watch that. As far as tennis though, UND's got a pretty good tennis team, right? Yeah, they do. Uh, and their two best players this year, Tom Zuch and Edgar Duste from France. Those two just won nationals uh, in, in down in Georgia, the ITA doubles national championship. Um, they got it done they won the first set six to four and then they lost the second set two six and then in the third set this was the big one they got it done they dominated ten to one in the final set and it was a huge finish that time and now the two move on to san diego california they move on to the ita national fall championship that's going to be this upcoming week november 2nd through the 6th tuesday through sunday and those two are going to try and get it done for you and it's going to be a huge weekend and i'm really looking forward to see they can get it done. Now let's switch gears and talk about a game that all three of us were at over the weekend. How about you and football? We were both at the game. Man. You called it for radio. First of all, how'd the call go for radio? Oh, it went awesome. Best call of the year, and it was a great game. I love to hear that. So they won, obviously, a great game. Got that big lead to start, and then Quincy started to come back and really make it a game. Final score was 52-38, though. So in the end, it was a Michael Brown interception that kind of sealed the game. But it was a heck of a game. It was a lot of fun to watch. What do you guys think? Oh, it was a ton of fun to watch. It was probably my favorite game of the season to watch so far because Quincy came in four and three on the year, and they really just played an outstanding game. They got they fall they fell behind early, but that was really a testimony to UND's defense. Was they just got off to a hot start? They got a couple interceptions in this game early, and then UND just they kept running the football, which eventually got them the time of time of possession lead against Quincy on Saturday. It was a great game. Yeah, you mentioned they kept running the ball. How about Jaquan Buchanan? He came in for the injured Toriano Clinton. Tori's probably out for the year, so is Connor Kennett. So down their top two players, but we saw Conkling and Buchanan filling very nicely. We see here it's a Buchanan reception. So he had a touchdown reception, and then he had three rushing touchdowns as well. He had himself a great day, but it was in the fourth quarter here when Quincy started to fight back. As you guys can see here, the Greyhounds had a big lead. It was 42-10 to 10 going to halftime, and then Quincy just ate up on it. Almost ended up tying the game late, and instead it was a Michael Brown interception that you'll see here in just a little bit that sealed the deal. Yeah, and so Derek had a very big game. He stepped up big time for the Hounds, especially down a few players. He had eight receptions, 151 yards, one touchdown. But Quincy's quarterback, I was very impressed by Tion Harris. I mean, he set a school record for uh, single game uh, passing yards, 503 passing yards. Most of that due to game script, of course. They had to throw the ball 60-some-odd times. But I think that the uh, Quincy Hawks are on the come up a little bit. Yeah, and it wasn't just like garbage time yards that he threw. It's what we've seen a lot of guys throw a lot of yards against UND's garbage time when the Greyhounds are up big. But this was coming back and almost winning the game. So they were definitely some good stats, and it was pretty impressive to see Harris. 
Yeah, and Quincy falls to four and four on the year. They haven't finished above 500 since 2014, so it's going to be interesting to see if they can close out the year. They're in Truman State this week, and then I think William Jewell to close the year, so it'll be fun to watch, and it'll be crazy finish to the year for all of GLVC play. UND, six and one, trying to get to GLVC tournament all healthy. It's going to be interesting to see. Yes, it is. Hounds moved up to number 17 in the AFCA poll. So moved up three spots from number 20. Uh, looking forward to seeing how they continue the season. We're going to go ahead and pivot gears but, uh, and talk about some D1 sports. But before that, we're going to take a little break. Stick around. Okay. The day that JD was injured, I had woke up to a odd phone call. It was the military calling to tell me that he had stepped on an IED. The day I got injured, she got wounded as well. And the veterans wouldn't be the men that we are and the women that we are today if it wasn't for our better half helping us every direction we go. Find the nonprofits that support veterans. Offer your time if you don't have the financial resources to offer. There's always a way to help. Visit saluteheroes.org to learn more. Back here on Last Call, Jake Kiefer alongside Nathaniel Finch. And I want to extend a thank you to Graham Shear for coming on and talking UND football, tennis, and soccer for us. Uh, Some good things going on with UND sports here. It's a lot of fun to watch. Absolutely. Speaking of good things, well, not good things, I guess. Uh, my Hoosiers, man, they just ruined me every week. It was a tough outing for Indiana, and I don't really know what else to say about it. My Boilermakers are right there with you, but kind of the opposite. So IU started, and of course they fall to Rutgers 24-17. They started with a 14 to nothing lead in the first quarter. It was really an impressive showing on offense to start things off. Obviously, you get the kickoff return for a touchdown. The offense drives down the field, scores a touchdown. Things are looking good. Looks like you could blow this Rutgers team out. But then it just kind of all spiraled downhill from there. Isn't that how most of the season's gone for the Hoosiers? The entire season. And, and I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know if it's poor recruiting. I just, I'm very disappointed in the way things have turned out. I mean, Connor Basilak has not really shined as an uh, IU quarterback. Jalen Lucas only getting four touches a game. It's been, I mean, he, he's, he's one of the better running backs on the uh, roster. And, you know, he had the return for touchdown. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. It just seems like hope gets lost more and more as the season goes on. IU starts 3-0, right? Everyone's singing their praises the first three games. All of a sudden, now they're 3-5, and five, and it's just been kind of a tough skid. It's a struggle to get bowl eligible, and, and that's probably not going to happen because they have a tough stretch coming up where they hit Ohio State and they hit Michigan, or they already played Michigan, pardon, they hit Michigan State. So um, uh, I would love to say I'm looking forward to the rest of IU's season, but I think it's probably about time to pack it in. Let's talk about another Indiana team. This is the Purdue Boilermakers, and typically this is a part where I kind of make fun of you and your IU fan for a little bit and then start to rub it on how Purdue did. They didn't do too hot either. But this was kind of the yeah. opposite. They started slow. Wisconsin had the big lead. Purdue came firing back. They uh, got 14 unanswered points at the end of the game. It just wasn't enough to defeat Wisconsin on the road. And it was kind of a, a tough loss here for the Boilermakers. The final score there, 35-24. to 24. Yeah, Aiden O'Connell, he's kind of in the same boat as Connor Basilak for the Hoosiers. Uh, O'Connell threw three picks. I mean, he did have a rushing touchdown. Now, he threw for 320 yards, so there's the dif big difference yeah. there. He's actually completing passes, and, and the coaches are scripting plays that work for once and, and have for Purdue in the entire season. Uh, but the run game has been pretty impressive as well for him. Devin Mockaby, I mean, 23 carries, 108 yards, a touchdown. Brayden Allen on Wisconsin's side, 16 carries, 113 yards and a touchdown. I mean, Wisconsin was better in the run game, but Purdue looks sustainable in the run game. Yeah, and it was tough for Purdue because, I mean, we've seen a lot of great games this year from Aiden O'Connell, especially to start, started really hot. It's not like him to throw three picks, right, and especially not have any passing touchdowns. So the hope there is that it was just a fluke game and that they can continue to roll through the rest of the season, but it was just kind of a tough showing when your quarterback throws three picks and – it's, it's definitely not what they're wanting. And we see here they're down 28-3, to three and, and then things start to go. So that's kind of the opposite of IU, where they started with a big lead and then dropped it. Here it was you know, Purdue with Payne Durham and Aiden O'Connell who started to get things going. 
Yeah, Payne Durham looked good. I mean, that one-handed catch was pretty awesome to see happen. Uh, but Wisconsin, they're, they're just the better team in this game, and they, and they shouldn't be on paper. They haven't looked great all season, and, and that's kind of the duality of Purdue football at this time. Yeah, for sure. The final score there again, 35-24. to 24. Not what you want for Purdue fans or IU fans as that records game ended 24-17. Yeah, my big question for you, though, Nathaniel, is what happened to the top 25 vote-receiving Purdue team that beat Minnesota in Minneapolis? I mean, what, what went wrong? I don't understand. And because basically this whole season has been so up and down. You've had great games from Purdue, you know, tough losses where it's like towards the end they lose by a field goal or whatnot. But then they've got games like this one where they just lay an egg and it, doesn't, it just doesn't look like the Purdue team. I think you can chalk most of it up to turnovers, though, because O'Connell was not himself. And it's just... Not fluke interceptions, they were definitely on him, but it's just one of those games where you're just not feeling it. Yeah, it was, it was tough for sure. Tough for me to watch as well. I always root for the in-state teams when they're not playing IU. Well, let's switch gears and look around the rest of Division I. Um, I personally was a big fan of uh, the, or the Clemson-Syracuse game, pardon. Uh, number, eight, or number five, Clemson. Number 14, Syracuse. Both teams undefeated. It was a very interesting game, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it all came down to chalk. It was Clemson who won. They remain ranked fifth. Those top six rankings in the AP poll didn't really change at all. But for Clemson, it was just a really gritty win. It was good to see them come back to the 17-point fourth quarter for Clemson. They handed Syracuse their first loss of the season. It's a good Syracuse squad, too. But the real difference, Clemson's run game. Will Shipley, 27 carries, 172 yards, two touchdowns. Toriano Clinton-esque stat line. Garrett Schrader as well uh, looked good in the pocket. He did throw an interception, but he threw a touchdown as well. I was, uh, it was fun to watch Phil Malfa from Clemson, 18 carries, 94 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, it just seemed like Clemson had all the answers for anything that uh, Syracuse was thrown at. The final score was 27-21, and it was just a really fun game, right? So you get a lot of these college football games where – it is you know, 40, 50, 60 point blowout, but this is one of those fun ones that it was a lot of fun to watch. Is Clemson for real this year? I think they are. You think they can make the playoff and, and make some noise? I think they can. Maybe they're not like number one as good as Georgia, but I think they're a real team that can sneak in and do some damage for sure. I think, I think you're right. I think this win actually proved that because they really had to you know, grind their teeth and, and pull it out by any means necessary with their quarterback struggling. Uh, uh, does Syracuse take any negatives away from this performance, though, besides the fact that they lost? You definitely want to put up more points, but, I mean, you're going up against a top-five team in the nation, and you hang in. You're only down by six, but at the end of the game, you got to feel pretty good about it. But, I mean, again, it's not – they didn't win, and that's what the final goal is. So I don't think that it's the end of the season for them, but it's definitely not – I mean, they're not coming out too happy because they didn't get the win. It's no. just – it could have been worse. Finish out the rest of the season strong. We could see them in a New Year's Six. Who knows? It's just how things play out. It's yeah. college football, right? For sure. Well, next in the column, Alabama get back in the uh, win column. It, it was a good performance. Bryce Young's back. He's cooking. They beat Mississippi State, who came in ranked number 24, 30-6. I think it was a very convincing performance from Alabama. Yeah, and this was not one of those close games because Alabama was able to come up with a lot of points. Not the normal Alabama 50-something points we're used to seeing, but it was definitely a good showing where they were able to come in and you know, put a ranked team down the way they did, only allowing them to score six. And then you see Bryce Young, like you mentioned, he was cooking. He had himself a great day, and it was good to see coming off an injury that he's still been kind of rusty coming back. Yeah, he did so well, and then they were up by so much that Jalen Milrow got a little uh, run at the end of the game. So Young really spread the ball around. Seven Alabama receivers with multiple receptions, really you know, sharing the love. Ja'Cory Brooks, though, I, he was fantastic. Three receptions for 74 yards, so... Not necessarily the big reception numbers, but that yardage, I mean, 74 yards, what more can you ask? Yeah, exactly, and it was, it was just good to see Alabama be back, right? It was kind of weird seeing them on the schneid for a couple weeks, but they're ranked sixth. I think if they can fin finish out the season strong, they'll slip into that top four. We'll see what they can do. They can definitely be a team that makes a lot of damage and ends the season as one of the top. And they could be one that people would be sneaky. Uh, they, they'd be a sneaky pick because... They've you know, gone down on the rankings. Yeah. People are kind of doubting them a little bit. They could very well bust your CFP uh, bracket, per se. It's not often that Alabama's the underdog, but I think you're right. They would come into that tournament as an underdog and 
I mean, whenever Nick Saban's an underdog, that's definitely bulletin board material. He can get the guys fired up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, speaking of underdogs, TCU. This yeah, is my buddy. new favorite team right now. TCU, man. They're fun to watch. Number eight came into this one and uh, beat Kansas State 38-28 in convincing comeback fashion. Yeah, you can't call these guys underdogs anymore. It was a great win, 38-28, and that was kind of the score for most of the fourth quarter as well. So they put up most of their damage the first three quarters and then just kind of held on to that lead, salted the clock away towards the end. That's two weeks straight that they've had double-digit comeback wins. It's been very convincing uh, to watch from a playoff perspective. I think I'm ready to take a shot on them being in the playoff. Max Duggan, told you to remember the name last week. You did. 17 for 26, 280 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, the man is on fire. He's fun to watch. He's got a big arm. He senses pocket presence. He's sneaky athletic, too. When the, when the uh, pocket breaks down, he's able to get out there and, and gain some yardage with his feet. Kansas State's a good team, too, right? They're ranked 17 this game. They do fall down to 24, but it's not just some Joe Schmo team that TCU was able to put away. It was a great win against you know, what ended up being a top 20 team at the time. And you got to keep in mind, Kansas State lost Adrian Martinez early in this contest, and Will Howard had to step in, and I'd say he did pretty well. 225 yards, two touchdowns, did throw a pick, but that's kind of to be expected from a backup who didn't even know that he was going to be playing until two plays into the game. Yeah, definitely didn't do too bad, so keep an eye on TCU moving forward this year. Well, when we come back from break, we're going to get into some NFL review and, and then preview Monday Night Football. Stay tuned. The day that JD was injured, I had woke up to a Yo, odd John. phone call. Cool. It was the um, military calling to tell me that he had stepped on an IED. The day I got injured, she got wounded as well. And the veterans we wouldn't be the men that we are and the women that we are today if it wasn't for our better half helping us every direction we go. Find the nonprofits that support veterans. Offer your time if you don't have the financial resources to offer. There's always a way to help. Visit saluteheroes.org to learn more. The day that well, welcome back to Last Call, Jay Kiefer, Nathaniel Finch. As always, Nathaniel, tell us a little bit about the Colts. I don't even know what to say anymore. This Colts team, they hang the fruit out. They make you think that they can be something this year. They get on a little bit of a win streak. They beat the Jaguars last week. Things look good. And then they go into Tennessee, right? where if they win, they're number one in the division, they're looking good, they've got a chance to control the AFC South, and it did Went not happen. They have elected Went to down defer, to Tennessee, so the final score there was 19-10, to 10, and it was just a tough game to watch. You see there, number two, starter no more. He's been benched. Sam Ellinger is going to start the rest of the season. Did end up getting a little banged up, but they were going to make the change anyway because he is now leading the league in interceptions with nine. But we see Paris Campbell, he had a great day. He was able to get the first touchdown and only touchdown on the board for the Colts. That score was 17 to three at the time. And then it was just a field goal fest for the rest of the game here in the fourth quarter. And it was the Titans who were able to put up more three point plays than the Colts were and ended up winning that one 19 to 10. But it was just, it was a tough showing for Colts fans. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, really it was all about the Titans defense. Andrew Adams uh, scored the only Titans touchdown on a interception. Um, I was a big fan of him in the, in the game, 10 total tackles, six solo. But Matt Ryan, man, it was, it's just a tough performance every time out for him. He now leads the NFL in interceptions with nine. And that's probably going to be the last interception he throws all year if Sam Ellinger can play halfway respective. You see Derrick Henry rips up the middle of the field. He had a great game, as he always does, especially against Colts. 30 carries, 128 rushing yards, and it was just able to take the air out of the football. We see here another of these field goals. A lot of long field goals too as well. We saw Chase McLaughlin hit a 50 plus yarder. That was a 50 or a 48 yarder there from Randy Bullock. And it's just a 19 to 10 score. It's because a lot of field goals here, not a lot of touchdowns. Yeah, I, Jonathan Taylor though, I mean, he, he just isn't the same. I don't know what is different besides the offensive line, but he just hasn't really been able to get it going the past few games. Let me tell you, is six yards a carry a pretty good number? It's great. I'd say six yards a carry is pretty good, but they only gave him 10 carries. You have to feed Jonathan Taylor, and I mean, Derrick Henry didn't have the biggest yards per carry clip, right? He had 30 carries for only 128 yards, which in the end gets you what you need, but it's because they kept giving him the rock over and over and over. He had 
three times the amount of carries that Jonathan Taylor did, and Taylor only had a little less than half the yards. So, I mean, when it comes down to it, just keep feeding your guy, especially if he's putting up six a carry. I don't understand the disconnect here. Why give it to Matt Ryan, who leads league in interceptions? We had a couple fumbles. You saw one from uh, Michael Pittman earlier on that highlight reel, but it's just, I mean, you can't call it a highlight reel, but from that B-roll. But for the Colts, I just don't understand why you don't hand the ball to Jonathan Taylor every second play, if not more. Yeah, Nathaniel, you said it. Uh, Sam Ellinger is now the starter going forward. I have a feeling that this move makes or breaks Frank Reich's time in Indy. We'll see, depending on how Sam Ellinger performs. I personally think he'll probably do a decent job. He looked really good in the preseason, so there's the, kind of the hope for Indianapolis. And for Frank Reich, if you stuck with Matt Ryan and he just stunk it up the way he has been the rest of the year, you're not going to make it to the end of the year. So maybe now with a young guy, He's got a chance to buy him a little bit of extra time, but you got to think, if this offense doesn't figure anything out, he's not going to make it to the end of the season. Yeah, well, looking forward to seeing how that plans out for the Colts. Feed Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, right, that's, let's move on. It's a sound bite right there. Well, moving on, my Ravens, man, they held off the Browns in Cleveland. or I mean, not in Cleveland, pardon, despite Cleveland's comeback. Uh, Cleveland's two-headed monster of Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, though, they're fun to watch. Nick Chubb found the end zone, 91 yards. Kareem Hunt, one touchdown on five carries for four yards. Of course, he didn't get much of the workload, but he's that goal line guy that they're going to go after. Yeah, and I mean, with Cleveland, you think until you get your quarterback back week 11, they're just going to continue to run the ball over and over. Typically, it works, and it gets you in these close games, but you're not going to win a game when you kick it like that. You see it was blocked. Cade York not able to get it through the uprights and that kind of led to the end of this game. But who would have thought going into it that the Ravens would only win by three in such a close game? The spread was a lot more. It just seemed like it was a Ravens game, the way the Browns have kind of played this year. But they kept it close, especially at M&T Bank Stadium. It was a pretty pretty impressive game for Cleveland, but ultimately you got to hit that field goal. Well, uh, and, and the Browns, they effectively took Mark Andrews out of the game. Mark Andrews had no catches on two targets. I mean, that was the game plan going in for the Browns. It's probably going to be every team's game plan against the Ravens from now on. But, uh, you know, they rode the Gus bus all the way yeah. to the win. Gus Edwards stepped in for the injured J.K. Dobbins, 16 carries, uh, 66 yards, two touchdowns. So. And when you can effectively neutralize Mark Andrews, of course he was a little banged up going into the game, so it's not like he was going to be at his best anyway. But their top two receivers, two catches for, 20, for 42 yards, Four catches for 42 yards. That was from Devin Duvernay and Rashad Bateman, respectively. Not big days from your outside receivers. And it's always going to happen like that. You trade away Marquise Brown, your best receiver, and they just don't have much more talent outside of the tight end position. So, of course, if you can find a way to neutralize him, it's going to be a long day. And, of course, if you can keep Lamar Jackson from running all over you, which they did pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. I do find it important to note that Indiana native and former Purdue star David Bell got a catch for seven yards in that game. So congratulations to the former Boiler. Hey, a catch for seven yards, we'll throw, we'll throw it in every show. If David Bell's hey, doing good, we'll do it. We'll absolutely, it. absolutely. Well, moving on around the league, the Commanders topped the Packers without Carson Wentz. I mean, that was excellent. You lose your starting quarterback, you probably get better. Let's take a look at these highlights from Taylor Heineke coming in here for the Commanders. And, I mean, who do you think is going to win, Heineke or Aaron freaking Rodgers? And it was – Ended up being Heineke, came back from a 14 0 deficit early, and the Packers just not able to get anything going after that. What a catch here, as you see, stay in the front corner of the end zone, but it was just a putrid day on offense. Yeah, it was a tough performance, but guess who is back, baby? Scary Terry, another Indiana native. Terry McLaurin, five receptions, 73 yards, one touchdown, and your boy B Rob, Brian Robinson, man, four weeks or five weeks after. Uh, or coming back after an injury, pardon. He led the backfield in touches as expected. I mean, 20 carries, 73 yards, long of 24. Couldn't quite find the end zone, but I think he had an excellent day. Wasn't just a normal injury, of course. And we talked about with the last show, shot in the league twice, come back, and he's now the lead tailback for this team, and he's playing great football. Can't say the same for most of the Packers, whether it be on offense or defense. They're just struggling. They're now on a three-game skid, and things are just not looking good. You had the game against the Giants in London where they lost, and they said, all right, we're okay now, but if we lose to the Jets, then we're going to have a problem. Next week, lose to the Jets. Blown out by the Jets, you could say, a couple scores. But then you come to this game, and you're like, all right, get right game. We're playing a backup quarterback. We can beat the Commanders who aren't. They, I mean, they haven't played too well this year. 
Maybe it's a Carson Wentz thing. Maybe it's this or that. But it just seems like they had a chance to come in and kind of just dominate this game, right, and get back on track. Rodgers didn't look good. Tom Brady and the Bucks didn't look good. Things just aren't looking good for these top NFC teams. Yeah. Moving on. 30-point second half gave the Chiefs the win over the 49ers. That was a crazy game. Christian McCaffrey's first game as a 49er. I mean, he only had eight carries for 38 yards, but I'd say that's because the game script kind of forced the uh, 49ers' hands there. Yeah, and of course, look at this. Christian McCaffrey wearing a number 23. We knew, he wasn't, he, we knew he wasn't going to come in and get a ton of run, right, because he just came to the team, was traded Thursday night, so Friday was his first practice. So he wasn't going to get the 20, 25 carry workload that he's used to. We knew it would just be kind of a short kind of run for him, but he still he looked pretty good and kind of gives this Niners team some hope. You would have liked to have him before this week started so they could have him against the Chiefs. But, I mean, in the limited work he got, it looked pretty good. The Chiefs ended up getting a big win. Chiefs are real. I think the 49ers are pretty legit too, but maybe just not this week because the Kansas City Chiefs are that good. Well, once Christian McCaffrey gets going in the offense, I think they'll be pretty good. Oh, and I bet you Kyle Shanahan has not slept a wink thinking about what he's going to do with McCaffrey in this offense. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we're going to preview the Monday night football game. We got Pat's Bears tonight. This can be quick. The military calling to tell me that he had stepped on an IED. The day I got injured, she got wounded as well. And the veterans wouldn't be the men that we are and the women that we are today if it wasn't for our better half helping us every direction we go. Find the nonprofits that support veterans. Offer your time if you don't have the financial resources to offer. There's always a way to help. Visit saluteheroes.org to learn more. Back here on Last Call, Nathaniel, the Bears travel to New England to face the pa Patriots tonight. Catch that game at 8.15 on ESPN. Who do you like in this game tonight? I think it's pretty obvious the Patriots are going to be the favorite, right? So it's 8.5 is the spread here. The Patriots at home against a pretty putrid offense here in the Bears and just a team that's really struggled a lot. The Patriots have looked great, though, the last couple weeks. So I think they're going to be the run runway favorites. I think they're going to win the game by more than 8 points, too. I'm probably taking the Patriots spread for sure. Uh, but Mac Jones' list is questionable. Could be Bailey Zappi, uh, which means more work for Ramondre Stevenson. I think it's definitely going to be Zappi, and I think that the Patriots are going to have a decision moving forward. Do you want to continue with Mac Jones coming off an injury or let Bailey Zappi continue to shred up some teams because he has looked good, the unsung hero here, third-string quarterback coming into the year, and he's been a great player for this team. I think he's going to come in and light up this Bears. Hmm. Wasn't there a third-string quarterback a few years back in uh, New right. England that happened to do the same thing that Zappi is doing? Is this the second coming of football Jesus, Tom Brady? Well, let's take it easy on that, all right? Of course, Bill Belichick, the common denominator there, he's looking to move into second all-time playoff and regular season and coaching wins, right? So he's only about, I think it was about 20 wins behind Don Shula for first place, but he's going to move past George Hallis. George freaking Hallis, he's going to move past playing the Bears. This would be huge if they can get that win, and you know Belichick cares about that type of history stuff. Oh, yeah, he does. And, you know, they've seen scheme for it all week. He knows what Justin Fields is going to do in this game. He knows what all the, all the receiving core in Chicago is going to do in this game, and he's studied it constantly. So I'm taking the pats, like you said. Yeah, I think with that idea in mind that he's going to pass the former Bears legend playing the Bears for second all-time in coaching wins, it's too storybook for it not to happen. They're going to win and probably going to win by more than eight points. I'd say I wouldn't be surprised if the score was somewhere around 25 to 10. Yeah, I'm, I'm staying away from the over-under on that one because, I agree. you know, you, you just never know with the Bears. They could put up three points. They could put up 30 points. Who knows? Staying away from that. Prop pick of the day, though, Ramondre Stevenson over 63 and a half rushing yards. Get Absolutely. That. Absolutely, man. Minus 110's the odds. You've got Damian Harris, who is not playing. He's a bit of an injury here. He looked good last week. Ramondre Stevenson did. I think he can come in and definitely go well past that 63 and a half number. You want to get fun and then do a little parlay, I'm going Pat's money line. I'm going David Montgomery anytime touchdown. I'm going Ramondre Stevenson anytime touchdown. Plus 933 odds. That means 10 to win 93. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us on Last Call. Jake Kiefer alongside Nathaniel Finch.